Hello everyone, this is Spencer Snowling from Hydromantis, and thank you for coming to today's GPSX webinar. We're going to be talking about modeling aeration systems, and uh, so I'm glad that you were able to make it. My name is Spencer Snowling, I'm VP of Product Development at Hydromantis, and the guy that does uh, many of the webinars that we do here as part of our regular webinar series about once a month. We come on and tell you some information about either some feature of the software or some modeling aspect and um, uh, answer some questions and run some desktop demonstrations in order to uh, let everybody know about all the uh, features and advanced modeling stuff that's available for you to use in your software. So the agenda for today is to talk a little bit about the GPSX aeration modeling approach that we take and talk about the features and the different sort of um, customized aspects of some of the more advanced parts of the of our uh, GPSX uh, oxygen mass transfer model. So um, this is actually a update of an old webinar that we did many years ago where we talked about the basics. Um, so I'm going to do that again today. I'm going to kind of start right from the very beginning about what we're trying to achieve with our uh, aeration model. Um, and then we're going to go on and talk about some of the more advanced unit processes and how their, their uh, aeration models are different, like the high purity oxygen one, for example. And then I'll talk a little bit about, uh, or I'll do a few uh, demonstrations and talk about the advanced features that are in there, like places where you can customize the oxygen transfer efficiency and so on. And we will also talk about the tips for setting up aeration systems. These uh, aeration models are actually one of the more complex parts of the, of the software. There's a lot of different things you can do. We've, we've developed it in a way that allows you to model a lot of different types of aeration systems all together in one unit process. So uh, you'll notice that the, uh, the menus are actually fairly lengthy and there's a lot of parameters to look at. So we'll go through all that today so you'll know where to look for what you want to find. And then lastly, I'll touch upon um, advanced uh, aeration control options, like ways of having a timer control the airflow. So it comes on for a period of time and goes off. And also doing more advanced process control, like ammonia-based aeration control, uh, or ABAC. Um, these are things we've talked about in other webinars, but I'm going to touch on them uh, again today. And then, as always, uh, we'll be uh, answering some questions at the end of the webinar and uh, hopefully we'll have everything wound up um, in about an hour. So over in your GoToWebinar dashboard, you'll find the questions panel. So if you pop that open, you'll find there that you can type in some questions. And as per usual, um, I invite you to do that as we go along and I'll just let those collect up. And then after we're done the end of the webinar, I'll stick around and answer a few of them as we go. <clears throat> okay. So let's start from the very basics. There are the GPSX aeration model, sort of the background. Um, the aeration models are found in almost all the activated sludge objects that, that obviously have an aeration system as part of it. So any place that you see one of our objects like this, um, that, that is uh, you know one of the brown mixed liquor type objects that has bubbles in it, that's pretty much guaranteed that there's going to be an aeration model in there that can do, do um, obviously this is representing diffused aeration, but we can do mechanical. Um, aeration as well. So these ones here that I'm showing on the screen right now, the CSTR and our, our regular plug flow objects, um, those are the ones that make up a lot of the uh, work that I see their clients doing. You know, you can use these and, and, and get to really advanced levels of BNR by making changes to the way the aeration is set up. So that's a typical uh, place you would find a lot of those details. Um, there, the aeration system also is found, our aeration models, in some of the other objects like the SBR and the MBR oxidation ditch, and uh, even in the equalization tank, even though this is not a, a biological reactor, uh, this is just basically, basically for doing mixing, you can actually do aeration in here as well. And it's found in many of our biofilm or, or attached growth objects as well. So you'll see here, this is the object that people use for uh, IFAS or MBBR, and it has essentially exactly the same aeration model in it that a regular plug flow tank does. So you can set air flows, uh, you can use a DO controller and whatnot in exactly the same way, but of course this is a biofilm model too. Uh, submerged contactor has uh, you know a fully aerated system, the aerated biofilms or BAFs, uh, the aerobic digester has its own uh, anaerobic granular sludge, which I'm going to come back to and, and talk about a little bit later. 
now, so that's kind of what we would call the objects that have our standard aeration model. So any place you have bulk liquid and you have either mechanical or diffused aeration uh, in training air into that particular system, we kind of calculate that all in, in the same way. We, in some places, there are different default settings, but the actual underlying equations are all the same. Now, some of the other objects that you'll find in the GPSX unit process table, which is on the left-hand side of your drawing board, um, you'll find some of the other objects have their own unique aeration systems, and that is because that is reflective of that particular uh, technology. So here's examples of a few. Um, so I'm sorry, that's not the IFAS. That is the aerated struvite object. Uh, there are MA, MABRs, for example, the se uh, continuous sequencing reactor, and then our two high-purity oxygen systems. Are, are ones that show uh, uh, their own special aeration model because they are using high purity, uh, pure oxygen in that case. So in all of these cases, what we really need to achieve here is to calculate the oxygen mass transfer coefficient uh, because that is used as part of our derivative of oxygen while we're doing the dynamic mass balance modeling for for oxygen across the whole plant. So without getting into a huge amount of calculus here, I will point out that this is the derivative term for a completely mixed tank. And you can see that uh, what we're doing when we're doing that, that mass balance, we're figuring out how much oxygen is going to change over time. It's a, the amount of oxygen coming in and the amount of oxygen going out. In those cases, we're multiplying the concentration times the flow. And then this term, which is the amount of oxygen that is added to the system from the aeration system, and then uh, plus or minus the biological reactions themselves. Now, really, this is the one that is what this webinar today is about, is trying to figure out how much oxygen is going to be added to the system through the aeration. And particularly, we're really after getting this oxygen mass transfer coefficient here. So KLA, we're going to talk about that. It's going to be available in the menus for you to plot and, 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 and play around with. Uh, okay, so in your object, so you drag... Uh, say, for example, a completely mixed tank over onto your drawing board and you place it down. And if you open it up and go to the uh, input parameters operational menu at the very top, the very first thing that you're going to have to set is uh, what kind of aeration method do I have? Is it diffused air or is it mechanical aeration? And then we allow you, you know, we either whichever one you've picked there, we allow you to either specify the airflow or, or mechanical power. Uh, use a DO controller or specify the KLA directly. Now, almost everybody uses either entering the airflow or the DO controller. Uh, that's a, by far a mass, vast majority of our users are using those two options. So um, it's going to show actually the DO controller as our default setting. Uh, that's just the way we have it set up, but you can free to come to this menu and make whatever changes you like. Okay, so. Um, once that's done and you've picked whatever methodology you're, you're specifying your airflow through, we then uh, we are able to take the information that you're providing to us and then calculate KLA via that method. And I'm going to show you exactly how we do that here shortly. We also calculate a number of other things along the way too, other relevant um, uh, inputs and outputs that are going to be part of that mass transfer calculation, such as the oxygen transfer rate and the oxygen solubility and a few other things. Um, and, um, and, you know, we can, if you have the DO controller on, for example, we'll, you'll be, we'll be calculating the DO, uh, of course, but then we'll also calculate what was the airflow that was required by the DO control system to be able to meet that, that set point. So all of that aeration model also is a property of, uh, the physical environmental conditions. So things like the, uh, lick, the, the air temperature, uh, the liquid temperature, the elevation above sea level, diffuser fouling, and so on and so forth. So as I mentioned, you'll see quite a few of these parameters over the next few pages here. Those are all the things that are being taken into account when you're running your model. So the good thing is because we are taking all of those things into account, you can actually see outputs for either standard airflow or field airflow because we can display both of those things. We're calculating them both. Okay, so what I want to do is a very sort of as quickly and easily as possible to go through our aeration calculations. Now, 
um, I will mention here, uh, I'm not, I've taken out all the parts where we're uh, dividing by 24 to go from hours to days and, and, you know, converting units. Really, I'm just throwing up the parameters and the calculations that are happening. So if you want to see the actual equations that we're using with all of the uh, unit conversions and everything else in there, uh, please go to the technical reference guide at the beginning of the section on activated sludge. You'll see all of the details. There's actually quite a few pages of it about how our aeration model works under all these different conditions. Okay, so as I mentioned, GPSX supports both mechanical surface aeration, as shown here on the left, and diffused aeration systems, um, as shown here on the right. And our diffused aeration covers both coarse bubble and fine bubble edge aeration, and there's even an option for you to sort of specify a user-defined diffused air system where you can, you can make some changes to what's going on there. Okay, so you first of all, as I mentioned, you start at the top of the operational menu and you select which kind of aeration do we have, mechanical surface or diffused air. Now, no matter which way, which one of the, these you've done, we the first thing with that we need to do is to calculate the saturation concentration of oxygen in that liquid, because that is going to be one of the sort of driving force of the oxygen transfer from the gas into the liquid the bigger the difference between the saturation concentration and the actual concentration in the liquid, the easier it is to get the oxygen in, right? So, so we, need to, we need this as our starting place for, for many of our calculations. So right here, what I'm showing you is that we're, we're calculating this DO saturation um, under our field conditions here as uh, tau, beta, omega, and then this number over here, which is this oxygen saturation um, at 20 degrees Celsius. Now this number we actually look up from a table that we have uh, buried inside GBSX. This is sort of a you know standard well-known relationship for um, for uh, you know elevation and for uh, temperatures. You know what is the what is the um, oxygen saturation concentration? And typically it's going to be something like 9.8 milligrams per liter or something in that neighborhood. Okay, so then what we do is we take that number and we multiply it by these three factors, which I'm showing here, these correction factors to correct it for uh, temperature, uh, our wastewater beta factor, which is uh, something that is uh, sort of a function of other things, other components in the wastewater that we are not actually explicitly modeling. It's a little bit of a fudge factor that's there to count for salts and other kinds of things that are not really part of this calculation. So. Um, it's going to sort of, you know, make a, a small adjustment to that. And then uh, the pressure pre pressure correction factor. So if we're working at pressure, a high or low pressure, we can adjust it up and down from there. Okay, so now we know what is the highest concentration that we could possibly get in the liquid that we are uh, under these certain conditions. And now we're going to let the model figure out how much oxygen transfer is going to happen under these conditions, knowing what the, what the saturation level is. So now we calculate uh, the OTR. So we're gonna get to our KLA value by going through the oxygen transfer rate. So uh, oxygen transfer rate uh, in this particular case, I'm gonna show you diffused aeration first, is uh, the uh, specific, sorry, the uh, yeah, specific oxygen transfer rate is the, is the airflow times oxygen transfer efficiency. And this is a number that um, you can either set directly yourself or you can use one of our built-in correlations, and I'm going to come to I'll come back to that a little bit later. But that's basically a number something like 30%. And then uh, we can then make a bunch of corrections here to get to our overall oxygen transfer rate. And so we're correcting for things like fouling and alpha, and we're correcting for temperature here. And here's our driving force. This is the oxygen saturation level. This is what our current oxygen level is at. And it's that difference. If this is much higher than this, we're going to get a lot more uh, transfer into the system. Uh, okay, so then we can divide the oxygen transfer rate we just calculated by that driving force in volume to get to KLA. Now, uh, uh, just to make sure, you know, we're sort of like multiplying by it and then dividing. Really what we want to do is we want to take the oxygen transfer and divide by this to get KLA because over in the derivative, we're going to multiply by that, that again. So, so basically, the KLA is that sort of, uh, you know, volume independent mass transfer rate. It sort of has now the number that is taking all of those things that we mentioned earlier um, into account, like alpha and all those things. It now says this is the thing that's going to drive the oxygen transfer in our particular system. 
Okay, so that was for diffused aeration systems. Now we'll talk about mechanical aeration. It's a little bit more straightforward uh, for this because basically here what we're doing is um, uh, we're, we're calculating the ox oxygen transfer rate again. We're going to get to get to KLA from power by going through oxygen transfer. Uh, we've got standard oxygen transfer rate is the mechanical power times eta, which is our, our mechanical oxygen transfer value. So when you multiply this by this, our units are going to come out of mass of oxygen per time. And so that tells us what our standard oxygen transfer rate is. And then we can divide that by saturation and make the same kinds of, um, you know, corrections that you did in the diffuse system in order to correct it for the field conditions. So we're correcting for alpha, which is, you know, this sort of uh, generic kind of parameter that calculates or, or corrects for the geometry of the tank and the number of other things. Um, and also the, uh, the, the constituents in the wastewater and so on. And then we're correcting for temperature as well. Uh, here, we're not correcting for fouling like we were in the other one because there's no fouling surface, so to speak. But, uh, but anyway, we come up with, yet again, the KLA, the oxygen mass transfer coefficient in units of one over time. This is the, the field conditions that we are going to apply. Okay, so that was the first two out of the three options that we allow. The last one is just entering the KLA directly. Now, this is very much more so for doing sort of theoretical calculations, but you know, it's there if you want to use it. So we're going to ask you for the KLA at 20 degrees Celsius, and we're going to apply our correction factors, alpha, fouling, and temperature, and then uh, that'll give us our field condition alpha. So, um, so there you go. It, it basically is three different ways. We're taking sort of three different methods to arrive at KLA, and then that is what gets applied to our system. Now, that's what you're doing when you're specifying, uh, I'm going to drive the aeration through the aeration system options that I'm, that I'm given here. I know that I'm going to be applying a certain power, or I know that I'm going to be applying a certain airflow, and then I just want to see what does the DO come to. Now, we also, of course, have the opposite of that, flipping that around. I want to use a DO controller to achieve a certain dissolved oxygen concentration. So we're going to be tackling those same equations, but in the backwards order, right? I already know what the DO I want to be in the tank is, how much airflow is required to do that. So instead of entering the airflow in this menu, I select use the DO controller instead. In fact, that is actually at the default setting. So uh, I'm going to use a DO controller. I want GPSX to calculate all that stuff and tell me what airflow was required to do that. So the way it happens in the background is the, the KLA is actually directly manipulated by a PID control loop. And you actually have access to like the tuning parameters and the sampling interval and all of that stuff for that PID controller. It's just farther down the menu under the more button here. The main thing you need to set is the DO set point. And if you click on this more button, it'll open up, you know, sort of our typical PID control loop menu. And you'll see all of those things like gain and integral time and so on. Um, you can make adjustments to those. I think over the years, we've kind of uh, got most of those default values into a really good place for the different kinds of objects that we have. So, so generally, you should, for the most part, find your DO controller will work nicely just out of the box. But if you find it's a little sluggish or a little over aggressive, you can pop in there and, and adjust it. Okay, so what the, the, the PID control loop is going to do then is it's going to say, okay, you tell me, uh, you know, what version, what amount of KLA is required to meet the DO set point. So once it gets there, we pick up that KLA value, and then we calculate what airflow was required um, to get that kind of a KLA or mechanical power, if that's what you're using. So we kind of basically do those exact same calculations I just showed you, but in the other direction, right? So we end up, we start with the DO uh, set point, and then we end up with the um, uh, airflow that was required to make that happen. Okay, so what I want to do now is a really simple uh, uh, demonstration here. Okay, so this is my uh, GPSX. I've put down the simplest of simple activated sludge systems here. Um, this is a, an influent object that represents the flow coming from a primary uh, clarifier. It's going into this aeration tank. It is then going into this uh, secondary clarifier here, and uh, we got the recycle, of course, and then onto the effluent. So really, this is all I really need to, to play around with in terms of looking at an aeration system. So here, uh, this is, of course, four reactors in series by default. 
And if I open up this menu, uh, I'll just very quickly take a look here. You can see that I, I have selected uh, default air, which is our, our, our uh, def sorry, diffused air, which is our default setting. Uh, entering airflow, which means I'm using a constant amount of air. And in fact, that is 20,000 meters cubed per day. And also, I'm going to evenly distribute that amongst those four uh, tanks in, in, uh, in series there. So this, of course, means that I'm dividing it evenly. You probably wouldn't run across that necessarily all that often in, in reality, but this is a default setting that we have, have put in here. Of course, you might, might more frequently see a little bit more of the air being put up towards the front of that plug flow tank. But for now, we're just going to leave it like this, and uh, we can see how that will work. Okay, so I'm going to pop over here, and I'm going to run a steady state uh, solution to the model. And now we'll, let's take a look at what aeration information we have available to us to be able to plot. So I already made bar graphs here. So just to make sure you're, you're familiar with how our bar graphs work, um, there are four bars here going from left to right, and they represent these four reactors in series. So this is the inlet end, and it goes this way, and this is the effluent end here. So we can see, uh, for example, in this DO concentration that the dissolved oxygen is actually much lower at the front end of the tank than it is at the back end. And in fact, if you just click on the bar, it'll tell you. So it's like 0.15 at the front and it's like five at the back. So, all right, so that's what you would probably expect because all of the load, all of our carbon and nitrogen and everything coming in is at the front end here and it's gonna get used, it's gonna use more oxygen at that part. There'll be less, uh, growth happening in the latter part of this tank. We can also take a look at the airflow down here. So as I mentioned, we have chosen to, to evenly distribute the air in all of these tanks. So each one of these is getting 5,000 meters cubed per day. That's that whole 20 that I specified divided by four. Now up here is the KLA. So this is the mass transfer oxygen that is being calculated. Uh, these are all available for you to plot, by the way. If you right click in the middle of this tank, go to output variables, go to oxygen transfer, all of this stuff, airflow, uh, you know, alpha oxygen transfer efficiency, all of these things are all available. Just grab one of these and drag it over onto a bar graph. Okay, so here's uh, KLA. This is our oxygen mass transfer coefficient that is being calculated from our constant airflow. And you can see here that um, right now, it's actually lower in the front and bigger in the back. So, so why is that? That is because by default, Alpha is lower, the alpha values that we use in a plug flow tank are lower in the front than they are in the back. And that sort of represents the, the dirtier wastewater coming in the front of this particular system. Now you're free to make changes to that if you want. If you want to use an even value of alpha, say 0.5 all the way across the board, that's uh, totally fine. We've kind of make it so that by default it's tapered um, a little bit. So, and that's why this is, is looking like that. And then lastly down here, here's our oxygen transfer rate. So, so basically we took this airflow, we calculate KLA, and then this oxygen transfer rate was how we got there. Uh, the oxygen transfer rate is actually showing in this particular case, that's actually most of the transfers happening here. Uh, the reason for this, the, this kind of hump in the middle is actually quite interesting here. Um, we'll note that at the front, actually alpha is lower. So our oxygen transfer is actually lower in the front. Uh, but at the back end, where we have lots of oxygen, at the back end, we're actually not as much oxygen being transferred. And the reason for that is that the driving force is not as much at the back end. There's a lot of driving force at the front here because our oxygen saturation would be way up here, close to 10. And we can see there's the difference between what we actually have and what saturation is, is quite big compared to right here. This is a much less driving force, so it's not pushing as much oxygen in. Uh, and that's why that, that looks like that. Okay, so I'm gonna run a little dynamic simulation here. So I'm gonna put uh, 60 days and we're gonna run this and I'm going to adjust the uh, influent flow and we can see how that is gonna affect things. So we can see here that of course, if I increase the loading that the DO is, is becoming lower because of course we're not increasing the airflow. It's a completely fixed airflow at this point. So if I lower it down, you know, the amount of uh, residual oxygen will be increasing, the amount is less left over, right? So, so that is sort of an example of, of what happens if you have a changing load, uh, you know, with a fixed airflow rate, your, your resultant D, uh, DO is gonna go up and down accordingly. <clears throat> and this didn't change because uh, it's a fixed rate. So 
I'll also show you another example of this, uh, but let's put the DO controller on this time. So by the way, on this menu here, I've actually dragged many of the items from our operational menu up here as sliders and little drop down menus just to make it convenient. So I'm gonna put the DO controller on this time and I'm gonna run another 60 day simulation. Well, let me pause this for a minute. Obviously you can see right away it's different. Now with the DO controller on, it's two milligrams per liter across the board here, right? So that means that the DO controller is come to life. It is now finding whatever KLA value is required in order to get two milligrams per liter of residual DO. So given that, we can see, of course, that we can then calculate what was the airflow that was required to make that happen. And of course, now it's not even across the board. It's all of the loading is up front. So therefore, all of the air required is in the front end of that tank. Uh, okay. so. So we've got these um, uh, idea here. We've got this um, uh, uh, system set up so that we can run it either as constant air or we can run it with the DO controller. And uh, you can set up whatever that you like. And of course you can change your DO um, uh, set points here for each individual reactor. Okay, let's go back to our slides. And now I want to talk a little bit more about the advanced features. Uh, I'll call them advanced features, the more detailed features of our uh, aeration model. So most of these features are found in the uh, input parameters, operational menu, and then they're found under one of these more buttons. So the purpose of the more buttons is so that we didn't have too many pages of parameters all together in front of you at one time. It's sort of like the less commonly used ones will be found in the, in the more button. Okay, so if I go to the diffused aeration more button here and I press that, I will see a fairly lengthy menu that has different sections where you would describe the nature of the diffused air system. So one of the first things you can do is specify what kind of uh, system it is. So is it fine bubble, coarse bubble, uh, jet aeration or user defined? And then from that, uh, you can set the alpha value and you can set the fouling constant and you can also, oh, sorry, I should mention that we do have different alpha values for different types of diffused air technology here. So you can see there's fine bubble, there's coarse bubble, uh, jet aeration, and so on. And you can see here the standard oxygen transfer efficiency is also something that you're required to set through this menu. So uh, there's two different options here that I would like to point out. So first of all, this standard oxygen transfer efficiency is right here. It's set at 30% by default which is a reasonable number, um, but you can either set it as a constant, meaning it will always be 30% all the time, no matter what's happening in the system, or we can calculate it from a correlation. And the correlation is a uh, oxygen transfer efficiency that comes from airflow rate. It, it varies with airflow rate, uh, depth of the diffuser. So is, is there's more or less water sitting on that system, uh, the type of diffuser and the diffuser density on, on, in the grid on the floor of the, of the tank. So uh, right now I'm showing this screenshot right here is when we are using that correlation. So instead of setting it directly, it's now asking you for all this other information, uh, which you can use. And so what this leaves you with then is a kind of a dynamic uh, oxygen transfer efficiency. As your airflow goes up and down because loading is changing or what have you, um, you can get different oxygen transfer efficiencies. Now, by default, under the default settings, they don't differ a great deal from each other, whether you use the constant value or the correlation. But you know, once you sort of um, venture outside the, the standard default settings, then you might find that the correlation uh, will get you closer to where you need to be. Now, lastly, I'll mention we did have that uh, user-defined diffuser type. So if you're using something a little out of the ordinary and you want a little bit more control over, over the oxygen transfer efficiency, you can select user-defined You'll get your own user-defined alpha factor, which you can change. And then uh, your SOTE, your oxygen transfer efficiency correlation is now something that you can, you can actually make adjustments to the parameter values that make up that uh, equation. Um, uh, so if you look in our GPSX technical reference, you can see all the details if you wanna to go to this level of, uh, of customization of your system. We even included an extra term on the end for situations where the uh, oxygen transfer efficiency is that for very, very deep tanks, greater than eight meters deep. Um, it's sort of the, the relationship kind of changes when you get down uh, that deep. 
Okay, so that tells you sort of how you can set up within one particular object, how you can set up the aeration system for, and I spent quite a bit of time on the diffused air version uh, because it has the most uh, stuff that you'll need to keep in mind and, and so on. Now, whether you've used uh, diffused or mechanical aeration, you can actually apply um, some limits here. So I'm gonna show you the airflow limit. So say, for example, I wanna run my system and I wanna have a DO control on, but I don't want, you know, I have a limit on how much air I can, I can blow into the system. So I wanna set like an upper limit on airflow. If you go to the system, input parameters, simulation run setup menu, you'll see here that we have this thing called apply aeration limits and it's set off by default, but you can turn that on. And what you will then have um, is turn it on there and close that menu. Then any one of the objects that you open up, any one of your bioreactors at the very top of that more button under diffused aeration, you'll now have access to uh, minimum and maximum value for all of the different kinds of, of systems. So one of these will be lit up here. So I'm showing you the version for flying bubble aeration. And this is airflow per diffuser. And then, so what will happen is it will always max out at this value. Is it'll, it'll never allow the DO controller to take you above that level. So what that means is you might not meet your DO set point, but at least it'll cap it at what the physical constraints of your, of your system are. <coughs> so not a feature that everybody uses very much, but it's there if you need it. Okay. So um, I will mention that uh, every place that we do aeration, we also do our standard energy calculations as well. So all of that detail about how much energy is required to provide the uh, airflow that the blower is blowing in for this particular system is uh, right click on the object, input parameters, operating cost menu. And then you can specify here some details about pressure drop and all, most importantly, the, the, you know, the combined efficiency of delivering that air. And so we've got some default settings in there as well. You can play around with those. But the idea is whatever the airflow rate is, we'll calculate how much uh, energy is required to be able to push that amount of airflow against the amount of head in the tank. And then we accumulate that and it becomes part of our overall plant operating cost summary. Okay, so once you've done that and you've run your simulation, if you right click on the object at most, in most cases, it's gonna be at like at the effluent point, right click and go to output variables, go to operating cost menu, and then you'll find a place where you can um, do the total cost and get all of the costs of all the different parts of that particular unit. So the total that I'm showing here is actually the total for all of the energy usage for like mixing and heating and pumping and every and, and aeration and everything else. But you can see here that uh, for this particular part, you can just look at the energy by itself. Th this is actually a fairly long menu where we break up all the parts. Not, needless to say, this energy cost will make up a good chunk of, uh, of what it is that you are, are uh, using at any particular amount of time. So, you know, a lot of conventional, activ activated conven uh, conventional activated sludge plants, you know, the aeration makes up a, uh, you know, a pretty significant uh, portion of the overall energy usage. Okay, so that is up to this point, our standard, what I would call the standard typical aeration system that you can access in at least a dozen of our objects or even more probably. Uh, the convention, the CSTRs, uh, the plug flow ones, the IFAS and all of those ones, they use that system that I was showing you. So I want to touch on a, a few of the special and unique aeration models that are, that are made up and the objects that are you know, have a real focus around a specific, uh, you know, type of technology that's really there to kind of optimize some aspect of the treatment. So, uh, so these ones are probably places, or for the most part, places where we took that standard aeration model and now we've enhanced it or made some changes. I certainly don't have time to go through them all. Um, in fact, it's for some of these objects, we actually have entire webinars on our YouTube channel about each one of these objects. But I'll just summarize a few things here as we go. Uh, so the continuous sequencing batch reactor object is, is this one, which you'll find, I believe it's at the bottom of the uh, suspended growth uh, group. It is actually, despite the fact that it looks like an oxidation ditch, it isn't. It's actually a round reactor where this particular arm moves around inside the system and the diffused air system is actually attached to the part that moves around. And the idea behind that, of course, is that you can then have some of the tank, whoops, 
Some of the tank being aerated, you can see these trailing bubbles here, and some of the tank will be anoxic, uh, depending on how it goes. And so uh, there's also a fairly significant um, uh, airflow um, controller system built into this particular object where you can have the timers go on and off and it can actually do hitting high and low limits and so on. It's There's quite a lot in there. The operational menu for this is fairly lengthy with a lot of interesting stuff. Okay, another one would be the high purity oxygen system. And we have two different objects for this. One is the closed basin, the other one is the open basin. So closed basin is your typical sort of Unox style uh, reactors in series with a headspace over top of them. Now headspace is sealed in and we have essentially headspaces in series. And so uh, typically we are having uh, mechanical aeration in the liquid. So it kind of throws it up and it's in training the, the gases in the headspace down into the liquid that way. So you have a gas feed that comes in that you have to specify. And the idea is here that you're going to have that high purity, you know, 95% oxygen kind of uh, gas. And then we also include in the model then all of the gas transfer that we would have in most of our models. Uh, but in this case, it's to and from the headspace. And then we're also modeling the concentrations in the headspace in series too. There's also venting at the end, and there's even the ab ability to actually put in some leaks in here as well. Um, and there's some pressure control and a few other things happening. So it's a fairly sophisticated model unto itself, uh, but you can actually plot the gas, the gas headspace concentrations, the partial pressure of oxygen goes down as the oxygen is being used and the other ones go up like like CO2 and uh, and so on. So um, it's a really interesting model to play around with. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of moving parts in, in modeling that headspace and it's really interesting stuff. The high purity oxygen open basin is uh, not, there's no headspace of course, because it's not sealed in. So in this case, this is a mixer with a gas feed that kind of feeds right through the mixer and then trains the gas into the liquid. Uh, down below. So we assume the whole reactor is completely mixed and you have to specify what the gas feed is. And again, we're doing all of that gas transfer, except in this case, there's no headspace. Now, this was part of a project that we did um, uh, with Praxair many years ago. Uh, and so it actually has quite a bit of other stuff in here too, if you ever want to take a look. Uh, there's a lot of temperature modeling going on in here and the temperature has an effect on the biomass and so on. It's also one of our more interesting uh, objects. Uh, and the plug flow tank with aeration header. So um, you'll find this actually right under our other regular plug flow tanks in the suspended growth group. It is, as far as the process goes, as far as the actual modeling of the activated sludge, it's actually the same as a regular plug flow tank model. In fact, it, the actual biological part is exactly the same code. But on top of that, we have placed an additional airflow distribution model. And so what you're modeling in that case is this, this manifold here and these drop pipes delivering the diffused uh, uh, the, the air to the diffuser grid at the bottom. So knowing what the airflow is for each one of these reactors in series, we then ask you for details about the pipe specifications, the valves, how the control of the valves is happening. And we can calculate things like airflow in each particular section of that system and the position of the valves and the head losses and so on. So. Um, these are all sort of another layer of aeration modeling that is kind of existing on top of, of what we have. So if you really want to dig into the details of this, um, I recommend going to our YouTube channel. We did a webinar on it a few years ago, and uh, you can see exactly how you can take advantage of looking at different control systems and so on, and how, and how that can be accessed within this particular unit. Now, as far as when we get to all that airflow has come out and we get down to the the oxygen mass transfer part of it, that's all the same as what I had showed you before. Okay, I'll mention our um, uh, membrane aerated biofilm reactors as well. We can see that we have two different kinds here, hollow fiber and the flat sheet. And uh, these have specialized oxygen mass transfer models because uh, they're delivering uh, some oxygen inside of a membrane uh, that then is diffused out through that membrane and into the biofilm that grows on that surface. I will mention, just in case you didn't know now, uh, that we do have other regular diffused options in the bottoms of the tanks. So you can actually apply other air on the outside to the bulk liquid as well. And once again, we just did a webinar on this actually in, I believe it was November, December. Uh, and we went through all the details of, of how our MABR models work 
Um, and so therefore, uh, you should be able to see um, a lot of uh, uh, details about like there, there's the the oxygen transfer from the oxygen system into the bulk liquid and then from the bulk liquid into biomass and then from the membrane of the biomass there's lots of lots of terms in the and to keep track of in this particular mass balancing of oxygen in these systems we also have our relatively new aerated granular sludge or aerobic granular sludge if you like uh that is uh uh the nerita type system and so this one has a very similar aeration setup to what we have in our sbrs and that's because it is a a cyclical type of operation we have filling and loading and we have uh aerated periods and non-aerated periods and so on so so when you open up the operation menu you'll find that you have to specify how late how long you're aerating for and that at what airflow rate as well so just kind of follow the idea of what you're doing in in the sbrs and if you want to pop into a really good sbr uh, uh, webinar that's the one we did last month <laughs> and it's on the youtube channel as well uh, aerated struvite recovery, uh, it has its own model. It's actually pretty much our standard model. It just has different default settings for oxygen transfer efficiency and alpha and so on as well. Okay, so there are lots and lots of objects, as you know, in GPSX, and very large number of them have aeration systems already kind of built into them there. And uh, so you'll see that we've got that sort of standard approach. We've got all those specialty objects with their own special aeration models. If you ever have any questions about how any one of those in works in particular, the best option is to look at the GPSX uh, uh, technical reference, which you can get at from the help menu and then find that in there. Or if you have any other questions, of course, you can always email us at support at hydromantis.com and we'll be able to answer that. Okay, how am I doing for time? I got it. 42 minutes after the hour. So what I'll do is I'm going to just uh, also discuss a few advanced aeration control options because they're relevant to setting up your diffused aeration system. So uh, I think I think most of the examples I've got going along here uh, from now on are all pretty much diffused air. So um, the reason that I wanted to bring this up is that this uh, uh, object here, this process control object, is one of several that are available for you to put on your drawing board and use it to control the airflow in interesting ways. So this would be places where we want to do process optimization or they're, uh, you know, changing. Instead of just blowing a constant amount of air all the time, you can make it change automatically. You're building the control into the system. So this is kind of, all of our plants, uh, sorry, all of our objects have those regular DO controls built in, but this is maybe going a little bit beyond that. So in this case, for the timer controller, which looks like this, it has this sort of square wave on it. Um, this is the kind of thing that you could, for example, say, I want to have air on for 20 minutes, and then I want to have air off for 20 minutes, and then just keep repeating that pattern. So you would drop this object on the drawing board. You would specify here in the manipulated variable the label and the variable name of the thing that you want to control. So in this case, we want to control airflow. So what I would do is the easiest way to figure out what this word is, this, this is called the cryptic variable name, is to actually just uh, go to the airflow menu item and right click on it. And then it says copy cryptic variable name and then come back here to this menu and paste it right here. That'll say I want to control that particular object. Then I can set the total cycle time and then the on time within the one cycle. So a total cycle of 40 minutes, and then I want it to be on for 20 of those 40. And then you say, what is the value of this variable while it's on and while it's off? So that allows you to just basically repeat the same pattern over and over again while it's running. So and there's a couple examples of alternating aeration systems uh, for doing nitrification and denitrification in our sample layouts menu. Okay, we have another one uh, that looks like this. It's called the on-off controller. It probably really should be called a high-low controller because it doesn't actually have to go all the way to off. But nonetheless, what it do, what it does is it, you specify some high and low limits here. That's what would be represented by these black lines in this particular item here. So, so what you do is you say I have a high and low limit that I want to keep my control variable in between. In this case, I'm going to say effluent ammonia. And then I set the sampling time and so on. And now I'm going to be adjusting the airflow uh, to try and keep ammonia within that bound. You got that high and low limit. I want to keep it in that band. And what you do is you basically set some airflow rates for when it hits these particular limits. So uh, when, the, when the control variable hits the low limit, 
So when we got very low ammonia, I'm going to go with, well, probably at that point, we're nitrifying fully. So I'm going to back off the air a little bit. And then when it hits the high limit, when, it, when it's not nitrifying enough, uh, that means I want to actually go with the higher airflow value. And then this is what, what it should be when this is turned off. So therefore, what you tend to find is it kind of bounces back and forth or moves, roams around within this uh, particular setting. So uh, this is a nice, easy controller to set up and play around with. And uh, you can combine it with, with other types of controllers as well. And in fact, that's what this slide is all about, doing ammonia-based aeration control, or ABAC for short. Uh, we have lots of examples where you can link PID controllers in series. And the way you're linking it is that you say, I'm going to have one uh, controller that is going to set the set point of another controller. So in this case, the ammonia controller is looking at the uh, effluent ammonia, and then it's going to feed a DO set point into the, the DO controller, which is then going to ch change the airflow to meet that set point. So uh, you can link these things. It's called, you know, cascade several of these things together. There's lots of really interesting ways that you can combine these types of control systems together. This screenshot is from one of the examples that we have in our sample layouts process control group. There's five different layouts there with different types of uh, controllers put together. And uh, also, once again, I will recommend our implementing advanced process control webinar that's on our YouTube channel. And we did that uh, last summer. And so I, I, in fact, have several examples of a ABAC and AVN and other discussions about how uh, you put these types of controllers together in GPSX. OK, so let's wind things up with talking maybe about just a few tips um, on putting these aeration systems in place. Uh, so we're going to start by saying, you know, when you're setting up a BNR system here and you've got uh, for, say, this type of design here, uh, we've got five discrete zones that we want to be able to define in the model. So and they're of different volumes. Uh, the, the easiest and most straightforward way to do this is to set up uh, the numbers of reactors in series as whatever the number of zones are. That, it's kind of a standard way to do this type of modeling. Um, you may find that there are instances where you would like to have maybe say this this one in the middle be split into two zones that are both aerobic. You know that might be required if you have a particularly long you know plug flowy type of system. But for the most part, uh, a good starting place if you haven't done this before is to just set up one zone for each of the aerated or anoxic or anaerobic zones that you're trying to establish in your model. Once you've done that, then you can very clearly say, okay, these ones are aerated and these ones are not. So in this particular case, we're making, you know, an, an anoxic and aerobic zones up here at the front, another anoxic zone here, but the third and fifth tanks are aerobic. So, uh, so it was like a barden flow system, for example. So these are all ones that you can uh, set up and by having it equal to the number of zones that you're trying to define, that makes it nice and easy to get, to get started. So the way that we often recommend to people, now this is not, it doesn't have to work this way, but we do recommend to people that when you're trying to calibrate your aeration model, it's often useful to sort of turn on the DO controllers to begin with, set them to what the average DO airflow was, sorry, the DO was during uh, the time of the, the data that you're trying to calibrate to, and then let it predict what the airflows are. And then you could go back and adjust things like alpha or oxygen transfer efficiency and try to bring the airflows in and try to match those uh, to the system at hand. Uh, it can be done the other way around, but I find it a little easier to do it this way. So when you're doing a DO controller, there's another option that most people don't actually know about in GPSX. I'm going to bring it up here. When you're using the DO controller, you can specify uh, the control of the entire tank in two different ways. One of them is you can control each of those reactors, each of those zones, independently and then simultaneously all at the same time. So what I mean by that is that it's as if there is a PID control loop acting separately in each of the reactors, right? So some of them, if you if you were to set one zone to like a, a one milligram per liter DO set point and another zone at two, those two independent loops are doing their thing, finding the right airflow to make it so that it hits those two independent set points. The other option is, uh, control just one zone in your entire plug flow tank. And then the other ones will receive airflow proportionally according to the airflow uh, distribution that you have set up in the model. So, so what that means is that we're only one zone is actually going to hit a DO set point. All the other set points will be ignored. 
and the rest of the tank will just go up and down accordingly uh, to try and hit that one set point that we're focusing on. So again, you have to go to the uh, diffused aeration menu. You have to go to the DO control settings and then hit the more button and then come here and you'll find this thing called control cell. Now by default, it's gonna be at zero. By zero, we mean control all of the cells independently from each other. So each one has its own set point. That's the way most people use it. But if you needed to, and actually I did have a project last year where we did this. Uh, I, you know, This might be a system where uh, your particular plant out there in, in reality, the facility has a long plug flow tank, but they only have one DO probe. And it's like in the middle of the tank, for example. Well, then therefore, you know, they only know one DO value that they can control to. So they set their set point for that, that particular point. All the rest of the airflow that comes into the diffuser grid goes up and down depending on trying to hit that one set point. And that's how you would do that right here. So um, one, I can actually show you an example of that. I'm going to go back to our GPSX model. I'm going to reset it. And I'm going to run... Uh, this DO set point here. So just to start, you can see here, for example, this is the way it's conventionally set up. All of these particular reactors are all set to 2.0. And uh, it's got different airflows in each reactor, making it so that these all are going to hit their, their set points. So I made a scenario where we're going to do it the other way. So now in this particular scenario, let's open up this uh, operational menu. And we can look at, uh, we're using a DO controller here. And if I go to the control more button, <clears throat> we'll see here that now I'm actually got this set for two. What that means is we are only going to meet the DO set point in the second reactor out of those four. And the idea is here that that's maybe the way this is set up at that particular plant. They're the only place that we actually have a DO controller for. And all the rest of the distribution of air is following these air distribution fractions which we will have specified actually out here on this menu. And as we established earlier in this particular example, I'm just dividing up all the airflow evenly amongst the four reactors in series. So it's gonna come out looking different. It's gonna look like this. So you'll see here that uh, the, air, the airflow is being evenly distributed, but we are doing DO control and it is matching this one, bang on to two milligrams per liter. The other set points are being ignored. And we can see that if I run a dynamic simulation here, uh, I'm gonna move the influent loading around a little bit. We can see that no matter what we do here, that second reactor is staying very close to two milligrams per liter. But the other ones are going up and down. They just, you know, the airflow comes in, it meets that second, that second reactor setting, and then the other ones just go to whatever they're gonna go to. And so that's a, a you know an interesting aspect of being able to play around with the DO control options in a particular facility. Okay, back to the slides. Okay, summarizing everything. Uh, the diffused and mechanical aeration models that we have in GPSX uh, have actually all been there for a very long time. And we've, we've, we've uh, evolved them over all of the years that they've been there. They're all quite well established and well tested and well calibrated uh, for typical applications at municipal and even industrial uh, wastewater treatment. So um, we have these uh, specialized activated sludge units like the HPO or uh, the MABRs uh, that have specialized models that reflect a particular technology. So we may, uh, in those cases, have a specialized uh, uh, aeration model with different parameters and so on. Uh, but anyway, you can take advantage of using those as well. There are a lot of simple DO control options that are built into, into the individual unit processes, like that menu that I was just showing you right there. And then lastly, uh, the advanced DO control can be done by putting your plant on the drawing board and then going and getting some of those process control uh, controllers and dropping those onto the drawing board. They don't, they don't physically get connected to anything. You just fill in the menus. So doing ABAC or AVN or you know, any sort of those cascading type uh, controllers where you're, where you're feeding the one controller is driving the other controller, which is then driving some part of your process.